Hello everybody and welcome to the ZSL Wild Science Podcast. I'm Moni Böhm, Research Fellow here at the Zoological Society of London's Institute of Zoology, and today we're talking about my favorite animal, the badger. Why are badgers your favorite animal, Mon? Well, I studied them for my PhD, and as a result I am so obsessed with badgers, I have bought an illustrated children's book for myself at the age of, I don't know, 31 or so, solely because it featured a picture of a badger toasting a crumpet over a fire. Lovely, right? Also, one of the best things a friend ever gave me as a present was half a badger skull. I once collected kilos and kilos of prime badger poo for a friend's PhD experiment and actively enjoyed it. I got pooed on by badgers, of course interpreting it as a sign of affection, and once I even accidentally mooned a badger. Emphasis here being on accidentally. In short, badgers and I, pals forever. But not everybody in the UK is pals forever with badgers like I am. And so today, we delve into the ongoing story of badgers and bovine tuberculosis in England. Now, for decades, conservationists, vets, farmers have been at loggerheads about the best way to manage bovine tuberculosis, or bovine TB, a disease which can be a huge burden on farmers and their businesses. Bovine TB infects both cows and badgers, and transmission occurs from cattle to badgers and badgers to cattle, which makes the disease difficult to eradicate. In England, the government's current bovine TB policy encourages farmers to kill badgers in a series of culling operations. Now, to say the cull has been controversial is quite an understatement. Debate about this has been going on for years and years, and there is evidence that culling may not be effective at eradicating the disease. So more recently, there has been a call to explore badger vaccination as an alternative to culling. But anyway, I've been out of the badger game for years, so let's hear from those who are still in it, and let's hear about the evidence on the effectiveness, practicalities and the costs of badger vaccination, and if and how they can play a role in eradicating bovine TB from the UK. So here to set the scene and make a case for vaccination is Professor Rosie Woodruff, our resident badger expert here at ZSL. So Rosie, you've been involved in badger research for many years. Can you give us a brief summary on the history of the bovine TB saga here in the UK? Bovine TB is a terrible problem for farmers in Britain. It causes a great deal of financial and emotional difficulties. It's been running, as you say, for many, many years. Bovine TB was originally very widespread in the UK and then uh, was overcome by testing and slaughter of affected cattle. So that by the 1960s, Rates were really quite low in, in the cattle population. They couldn't get it to eradication at that point, And they worked out that maybe there was some reinfection happening from a non-cattle source. In 1971, they discovered the first infected badger. From 1973, there's been various forms of badger culling. This government has really taken that to the extreme and is now culling badgers over an enormous area. Currently, 75 percent of the southwest peninsula falls inside a cull zone. But um, that is uh, an ongoing policy at the moment. We have recently come to the end of this year's culling season, waiting to hear how many badgers may have been killed, expecting it to be in the many tens of thousands for this, this season's uh, this season's cull. Oh, wow. That's an enormous number. That's right. I think it's something which in another country would be, you know, something that we'd be flagging as a major conservation issue, even though this is a species which is common in the UK. We have higher badger densities than almost anywhere else. But, you know, nevertheless, the aim of these culls is to reduce badger density by at least 70 percent. So this is this is a major ecological impact across the western part of Britain. And of course, for the aim of eradicating bovine TB, the theory behind it is that if you have lower densities, then you essentially get rid of the disease, right? Yeah, exactly. That's the theory. Um, The practice is really different. And I think you're absolutely right to highlight that word eradication. That is the government's aim to eradicate TB from, in, in this case, England is the relevant area. And it's important to bear in mind what eradication means. So the World Health Organization defines that as having a permanent reduction to zero of the incidence of infection to the point where you no longer need to intervene. So in this case, although there would probably still be some periodic testing of cattle to make sure that TB was re- remained absent, there would be no need to, uh, for example, be you know, slaughtering cattle to control the disease because the disease wouldn't be there anymore. We are a very, very long way from eradication at this point. But I think it's very important to view any management uh, approach through the lens of wanting in the long term to eradicate the disease. It's certainly never going to be possible to eradicate TB from cattle just by managing badgers, because 
The best estimate suggests that only about 6% of cattle herds get TB directly from badgers. Most cattle herds get the disease from other cattle herds. Mm -hmm. So there's clearly a massive, massive problem of cattle cattle transmission. Having said that, because 6% of cattle herds get TB from badgers, You're never going to eradicate the disease from cattle unless you can also eradicate it from badgers. So while there needs to be a strong focus on cattle to cattle transmission, eradication is likely to involve some attention being paid to managing the transmission from badgers to cattle. Before we go into chatting about vaccination, which I suppose is also a way of lowering the density of the individuals that could be infected, what's the current evidence that culling isn't really helping to control the disease? There's been a lot of debate about it. Why doesn't it seem to work? You're right. There has been a lot of debate about whether or not culling works, and we're still having that conversation. The best evidence comes from a study that I was involved in, the randomized badger culling trial, which ran from 1998 till 2005 and involved killing badgers in some areas and not in others and comparing what happened to cattle TB. And we showed that where culling of badgers happened on a large scale in areas of about 100 square kilometers each, that inside those culled areas, cattle TB did go down. It didn't go down an enormous amount over a four or five years of culling. It went down by in the region of about 20% on average. So if there had been, for example, 100 farms newly affected by TB in the 100 square kilometers over a five-year period, say, then with culling instead, that would have been, let's say, 80 farms affected. So it wasn't a terribly strong effect, but it was a a clear and consistent effect, which happened every time we did that large scale culling. But those relatively modest benefits that occurred inside the culling area were to some extent offset by harmful effects on adjoining land. So what we saw was that although cattle TB went down inside the areas that were culled, it went up on adjoining land. And we think that the reason for this is that culling leads to really profound changes within the badger population. So in an undisturbed badger population, badgers live in groups. Each group defends a territory and they defend those territories quite fiercely, which means it's quite difficult for a badger to sort of wander across the countryside. Because if it tries to do that, it's going to get stopped by its neighbours who don't want it on their land and then the next neighbours will do the same and so forth. So badger populations have a crystalline structure where they're kind of held in space by their own social behaviour. And that means that because the badgers can't travel very far, the disease also can't travel very far. And what you tend to see in an undisturbed badger population is little pockets of infection um, and then areas where there's no infection and then other little pockets of infection and so on. Now, what happens when you cull badges is you lower the density, you remove and destroy that territorial behaviour. And suddenly those badges are ranging more widely. There's a lot more overlap, a lot more opportunity for interaction. And then as the badges move more widely, so too the disease can travel more widely. And so what we think is that culling has two outcomes from the point of view of disease control. One is that it reduces badger numbers. And if you're trying to control a, a disease that badgers carry, that, that could be a good thing. But also each remaining badger is more infectious to cattle and it's more infectious to cattle for two reasons. One is that it's traveling more widely, so it's got Mm. the opportunity to encounter more herds of cattle, but also it's more likely to have TB due to this increased mixing within the badger population. And what we think happens is that if you force the badger population to really low levels, then the fact that there's fewer of them outweighs the fact that each one's more infectious. Whereas if you only reduce the badger population a little bit, which is what happened on the adjoining land, where badgers were sucked out of that adjoining land, moving into the uh, to the cull zones, um, you end up with a situation where you've got each remaining badger more infectious, but there's still quite a lot of them. And we think that's why cattle TB incidents went up on adjoining land. It's really important to bear this in mind in policy terms, because what that study showed really clearly was that badger culling can have positive effects on cattle TB control, but it can also make the situation worse. And so any policy has to factor in that risk that, you know, if you get it wrong, that you could take a bad situation and make it even worse. Now, that was the randomised badger culling trial. The last cull happened in 2005. The final report was in 2007 and then there was no culling for a while. And then the current culling policy didn't get started again until 2013 when there were two pilot culls being implemented. And the idea there was that to avoid these problems that you get when you have sort of small culling areas, then licenses would be given to very large groups of farmers covering large areas with the idea that you would maximise the inside cull zone area where where we might see a benefit. And the, the government's sort of approach to that has been 
you know, if, if cattle TB might increase on adjoining land, let's make sure there's no adjoining land. And their policy has been essentially to aim for coast to coast culling across the sort of western part of the country. Um, and here where I am in Cornwall, currently 84 percent is currently under a cull zone. The difficulty is that it's quite hard to tell whether it works at the present time. The most recent uh, analysis is based on just three areas. Although cattle TB is a very serious problem for farmers, it's actually not that frequent an event. So, for example, if you had an area of 100 square kilometres, you might get 10 affected farms each year. So in order to be able to, to have an area where you've got enough affected farms to be able to tell the difference, between, say, an area where um, maybe you might have 100 affected farms versus 80 affected farms, which is the effect we were seeing in the randomised badger cunning trial, then you need really big areas to contain enough farms to have enough TB. And you have to implement that over a long time because it takes time for the effects to, to build up. The most recent analysis has concluded that in two of those areas, it looks like cattle TB has gone down. Although in one of the areas, it bounced back up again after they finished the analysis. And in the third area, it looks like it's going up. So I think it's really not at a stage where we can say that this policy is working. Despite that really quite weak evidence of benefits, this is something which has been enthusiastically embraced by farming leaders and to some extent veterinary leaders as well. And that's why it's been rolled out across large areas of the country, despite the limited evidence as to whether and how well it works as a control policy and certainly as an eradication policy. Moving on to vaccination, there has been a recent government commission review into this which proposed that vaccination as a non-lethal alternative might be something to be pursued. So what's the evidence that vaccination can work in this case? So the ultimate aim of badger vaccination is similar to that for culling in that it's trying to reduce the density of infected badgers. But it does it in a really, really different way from culling, because whilst culling reduces the density of infected badgers to some extent by trying to reduce the density of all badgers. And therefore, what happens, of course, is the badger population tries to recover. They keep on breeding. They keep on having to cull again and again and again to try and maintain that reduced density of badgers. Vaccination works in a completely different way. Vaccination works by reducing the density of infected badgers without reducing the overall badger density. So what it does is it, it does nothing, actually, to the animals which are already infected. What it does is it protects the ones which are not yet infected. So it reduces the ability for the disease to spread through the badger population and actually from cattle to badgers by protecting badgers against the infection. Now, what that means is what you would expect over time is that given that in, even in an infected badger population, most of the badgers don't have TB, mm. that you are able to vaccinate them because those animals can't become infected over time, you would expect the proportion of infected badgers to fall and therefore the risk to cattle to fall. There is some very good evidence from studies gone by government scientists which show that badger vaccination does seem to protect individual badgers. It also seems to protect unvaccinated cubs inside groups. So, for example, if you vaccinate a higher proportion of the adults in a social group, then when you come to catch the cubs, when they first come above ground, you find they're much less likely to have TB than in a population where the adults have not been vaccinated. So it looks like it works in badgers. Its impact on cattle is as yet not really properly tested because evaluating the impact of, uh, of any intervention on cattle TB requires a trial on a very, very large scale. And that hasn't yet been done for, for vaccination. But such a trial has been proposed. Over a year ago, the government received an independent review of the issue of bovine TB, which it had commissioned, which proposed uh, a large scale trial comparing the effectiveness of culling and vaccination to look at exit strategies for the government to move away from culling. Uh, ministers have repeatedly said that no one wants to be killing badgers forever. And so the independent review took the ministers to their word and said, well, then we need to look at alternatives and look at ways of, of moving away from culling. And one of the things that they proposed was badger vaccination as the most promising non-lethal alternative. Now, it's over a year since the government received that recommendation. So we're still waiting to hear whether that trial will happen. But the trial is it's a very important step in doing what was intended, which is to, to explore ways to, to manage these culled areas and just kind of move away from culling in those areas. But if the government wants to use badger vaccination potentially as a eradication tool, 
that trial will probably give a very incomplete picture of how well badger vaccination can work as a TB control strategy. Because the vision, the, you know, the sort of idea for that trial is that this would be something which would happen only in the areas which have already received four years of culling. Now, we know that culling has two really important effects on the badger population. One is it increases the proportion that have got TB. Now, from a vaccination point of view, that means it reduces the proportion that don't have TB. And it's the ones that don't have TB are the ones that vaccination works on. So the previous culling would have undermined the effectiveness of vaccination. And it also, by basically killing all the badgers that are willing to go into a trap, it creates populations which are trap shy. Yeah. Uh, vaccination currently requires trapping and vaccinating individual animals by hand. So the culling will also make it harder to access the badger population. And so the vaccination, at least in the first years post culling, is probably not going to work that well. Whereas if you were to also evaluate badger vaccination in areas with no history of culling, then you're likely to see any benefits that exist which should manifest themselves much more rapidly because badgers are relatively easy to catch. You can get relatively high vaccination coverage. The proportions with TB are likely to be lower than they are in culled areas and so forth. So that's why we've been calling for a proper trial of badger vaccination as a way of controlling cattle TB. That's why in, in our study areas in Cornwall, we've been evaluating badger vaccination as an alternative to culling. So there in Cornwall, you're already undertaking lots of vaccination at the moment, right? Because whenever I chat to you, like, I've just come back from vaccinating more badgers. That's right. So we have a project in, in Cornwall where we are trying to evaluate the ability of badger vaccination to reduce TB prevalence in an infected badger population. So we're trying to evaluate the ability of badger vaccination to do that. There's been lots of trials looking at how badger vaccination affects individuals, looking at how badger vaccination can be best implemented in terms of sort of logistics and practicality. But frustratingly, there hasn't really previously been a study which evaluated the proportion of badger with TB in areas which were being subjected to vaccination. So we're doing that at the moment in West Cornwall. And then we've added another area where having read about us in the newspaper, our team was approached by a group of farmers a little bit further east in mid Cornwall in an area which was going to be signed up for the cull. But one or two farmers thought they didn't really want to sign up for the cull for a whole variety of reasons. Um, contacted to us and asked if they could pay to have their badgers vaccinated instead. That's an amazing story because quite often when we hear in the news about bovine TB, it's generally that the farming community is for culling. That's kind of how it's portrayed a lot. And it's really nice to hear that there's actually mixed views in that community and that there's a willingness to embrace these new approaches. You know, farmers are people just like the rest of us and yeah. they're all different and they all have different views. I think that there's been a very strong push from some of the leading farming organizations that culling has to be the way to go. I think there's sort of a perception that just like some people think that, you know, medicine doesn't make you better unless it makes, you know, unless it tastes nasty. Mm. I think there's sort of a feeling that badger vaccination can't work. It's too nice to badgers, so it kind of can't work. I think it's a lot more promising in terms of TB eradication. So it was very interesting and very, you know, encouraging that farmers have embraced that. So, you know, I think it's really important to not represent the farming industry as a kind of monolith of people who are all the same and all the hate wildlife. It couldn't be further from the truth. As Rosie said, it definitely couldn't be further from the truth. And the story about the farmer signing up to the vaccination program in Mid Cornwall nicely illustrates this. So let's hear from one of them. You'll hear Keith Truscott from his living room, you can hear the clock in the background, talking about his motivation and experience with the vaccination programme. Now when Keith refers to Cheryl, he refers to Cheryl Marriott, Head of Conservation of the Cornwall Wildlife Trust. The Cornwall Wildlife Trust has a programme vaccinating badgers on their nature reserves. And so here Keith talks about the initiative of the Trust in partnership with farmers and Rosie's team to vaccinate badgers in an area of Mid-Cornwall. My name is Keith Truscott. I'm a small-time farmer down in Mid-Cornwall. Um, I'm here to tell you about the story of how I got involved with the vaccination programme. It started with the misery of TB, which is a misery. It's a great drain financially, even more so emotionally. And uh, I got tied up in with it last year. 
eventually we got out of it and we became clear but during that time the eradication of tb in cattle is primarily something we all want to see achieved um, we was getting a lot of pressure from the coal companies to join up to the coal several of us around this area were a little bit unhappy and uneasy about going down the line of a coal it seems to me a a sledgehammer to crack a nut and have we the right to destroy all these animals when it's not conclusive evidence that they are the cause so i was advised to speak to the wildlife trust and on speaking with cheryl at the wildlife trust it became apparent that there is an alternative that a lot of us didn't realize there was so Eventually, we um, managed to get a meeting together. Probably about 30 people turned up. About half of them was for the cull, actually. It was a lively meeting. But during that meeting, Cheryl demonstrated that there is a lot of sense in what she was saying. And a lot of us felt that it was worth pursuing. So after the meeting, after we talked about it amongst ourselves, we did arrange a second meeting uh, probably about 20 of us turned up to that and um, yeah most of us signed up to this vaccination program realizing it's not going to happen overnight it's a four-year program but believing that there's mileage in it hopefully after four years we'll be proved we're on the right line and the thing that personally i like about it is that we're not only vaccinating, but we are taking blood samples. We are collating evidence for future ways of trying to eradicate this disease. Because let's be fair, all we want is clean cattle, whether we're going down the line of vaccination or culling. The only thing we worry about is clean cattle, not having to worry about this TB. Hopefully we'll be proved that the method we're using will get us to that way. I certainly sleep better be night knowing there's people out on the land trapping and vaccinating rather than trapping and shooting. I think we're doing the right thing. When we got to the second meeting and signed up, it's a fair acreage. Um, it's about 18 square kilometres of land. So it's a fair area in the centre of Cornwall. And, um, well, we'll just have to wait and see who's proved right if, if our way... I mean, our theory is if we got clean badgers on our land, that will keep perhaps the poorly ones away. It will benefit us in having clean cattle. And that is the theory behind it. And hopefully that's the way it'll turn out. The way that we're going about it, it was so quick and easy to set up. Yeah, because with the cull and that, I mean, they had to go and get the right licenses and all that before they could start culling and that. And they didn't know if they was going to or not, but we, we just got going in a matter of four or five months and we were do we was doing the job, like, you know, and everybody is quite pleased with the way it's turned out so far. So hopefully more areas will perhaps join our example. Let's talk money. What's the cost of vaccination and culling? What's cheaper? Well, it's a really good question, a very important question. So, for example, in 2018, the taxpayer spent over £5 million on culling and only £175,000 on badger vaccination. So certainly the, the government has prioritised spending on culling, which is kind of a shame because vaccination is actually dramatically cheaper than culling. It's always been assumed that vaccination must be more expensive because crudely vaccines more expensive than bullets. But actually, a lot of culling involves a lot of the same kinds of approaches as vaccination does. So if you're using cage traps, everything you do up to the point of seeing the badger in the cage is the same for culling versus vaccination. And then there's the difference of whether you vaccinate and release the badger or you kill it and then you have to pay to dispose of the carcass. I did some calculations based on data from 2017, which suggested that it cost about £2,200 per square kilometre per year to cull. And I estimated it was closer to about £600 per square kilometre per year to vaccinate. 
that vaccination is done partly by drawing on volunteer help. But then so too does the culling because there's a lot of farmers contributing at no cost to this themselves. In terms of the cost to taxpayers, the huge, huge difference is the cost of policing. So about half of the cost of culling is the cost of policing. People do protest against it. And so there's a substantial cost of policing to keep everyone safe. The cost of of policing vaccination is precisely zero. Nobody protests against vaccination. It's not dangerous to anybody. And so that's something which helps to make it much, much cheaper. So we've calculated that in calling for a proper trial of badger vaccination based on the best available estimates of cost, you could vaccinate badgers over an area large enough to be able to really detect what the effect was on cattle for less than taxpayers spend currently on a single cull zone. I think the government could save money by trialling vaccination rather than continuing to help finance culls. I mean, these numbers, they're the kind of numbers that maybe you should put on the side of a bus, on a big red bus. Spend that money on the NHS instead. Now, we're not alone here in England in terms of having the issue of bovine TB in cattle and badgers. Our neighbours in Ireland have also faced the struggle to control the disease. And with it, much like here in England, has come a lot of research into the impact of culling on badgers, much like the randomised culling trial Rosie talked about earlier, and whether other control strategies like vaccination could help to eradicate the disease. So I'm really pleased that on the other end of the line now is James O'Keefe, who was until recently the head of the wildlife unit of the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine in Ireland, and has therefore been at the heart of Ireland's bovine TB control strategy, most recently by moving to replace reactive culling of badgers with badger vaccination. Now, James, it's great to talk to you. We're so often tied up with our own bovine TB saga here in England. Can you give us a bit of background on what the story was in Ireland? Okay, sure, Monica. Well, the eradication program here began in 1954. It was a voluntary program and it became compulsory then in 1958. Back then, TB was rampant in Irish cattle. And over the first 10 years of the eradication program, there was huge progress. Progress was such that had the downward trends continued, the then Minister for Agriculture announced that TB would be eradicated by 1966. Unfortunately, the downward trends didn't continue. And uh, we then went into... 35 years of basically no progress. There was between 30 and 40,000 reactor cattle removed every year. Everybody then started to blame everybody else for the lack of success. And that went on for 35 years. Finally then, at the end of that time, data began to emerge from England that badgers contracted TB. So then people started to look at that here. That in turn led to a decade of research that basically went from An initial piece of work in East Offaly that showed if you remove badges in an area, there was a dramatic reduction in reactor cattle. Now, scientifically, that particular piece of work had a lot of flaws, but, you know, just to look at it, it was impressive, the fall in, in reactor cattle. That then led to a more detailed study called Four Area Project, Four Area Study, which attempted to quantify what happened to TB levels in cattle if you had fairly intensive removal of badgers with less intensive removal of badgers. That again showed that lowering the density of badgers resulted in uh, lower levels of TB. That piece of work then led to basically the wildlife unit and the job I was given in 2001. The program then became, if a herd broke down in an area with three or more standard reactors, we considered a serious breakdown. So three or more standard reactors would represent about 30% of Irish breakdowns at the time. So if you had three or more standard reactors, a government vet carried out an investigation on your problem to, to try and establish the cause. If a purchased animal, an already infected introduced animal, was ruled out, And if badgers were in the environment, a survey was undertaken basically out one kilometer from the herd. You could assume that if purchasing was ruled out in a herd, badgers were in the vicinity because there is nowhere in Ireland where you have agricultural land where you don't have badgers. So following that survey then, sets then were identified. They were uh, logged on a GIS system and capturing then was undertaken in that zone. So over the last 18 years, 35% of Irish countryside has come in to that capturing program. The fortunate thing over the last five years, the area of land coming into the program each year isn't expanding. Our wildlife program has identified the endemic TB areas. 
and the capturing programs are running within that 35% of land every year. We remove 6,000 badgers every year to maintain the density at roughly a half a badger per square kilometre. Our densities would be somewhat lower than what you're dealing with in England. Our badgers seem to operate at two to three badgers per square kilometre, whereas in England it's maybe double that. So this constant recapturing to remove 6,000 badgers, there's no benefit to continuing that because we remove a badger and then a badger comes in from the 65% of the countryside where we're not capturing. So you're just creating a vacuum that's filled by another badger that you capture, and that could go on and on and on. Coupled with that, the badgers in the non-endemic areas have uh, TB levels of someplace between 15 and 20% in, in our country. And the 6,000 badgers that we're removing every year, they also have a TB level of 15 to 20%. So continuing capturing is going to yield nothing. You know, you're just replacing a badger that is likely to be 15 to 20% TB infected with another one. The next piece of research we did was to test vaccine. So the work we've done to date says vaccine has an efficacy of about 60%. Now that's done in pretty small numbers, but it's not that far off of what BCG has returned on any other species. So that's good enough for us to say it's likely going to be 60% effective in badgers. I thought I'd quickly interrupt this podcast at this stage where James and I struggle to say what BCG stands for and ask Google instead for the proper pronunciation. BCG stands for... Bacillus calmet gayran. Now let's have James explain this a bit more. Yes, it's the vaccine that has basically been used in human childhood vaccination for the last 50 years. Cool, okay, so you started the vaccination research. So the next bit of research was how effective was BCG, so now we say it's 60% efficacy. So it protects six out of every 10 badges it's given to. A lot of people don't like that, they think it's very low, but to us it's very helpful because if we replace the population we have with the vaccinated population, that's the equivalent of reducing the density by one half again, which is the key issue really. We would think that that vaccinating our badgers with a vaccine that has a 60% efficacy will actually provide a level of protection which will be the equivalent of halving their density, which will be the equivalent of, we estimate, bringing the reproduction ratio below one. So as you know, if you have a reproduction ratio above one in a population, a disease will expand. And if you can bring the reproduction ratio below one, the disease will actually peter out in both cattle and badgers. So that's our hope. Another quick interruption, the reproductive ratio of a disease James is referring to here is essentially defined as the number of secondary infections that one infected individual causes in an otherwise uninfected but susceptible population. Yes, today we really are putting the science into our Wild Science podcast. Back to James. So the final piece of work then we had to do was having shown that vaccine had an efficacy of 60%, we had to show that that you could replace vaccine for a culling program without any detrimental effect because farmers have great faith in our culling program because they've seen the results of reducing number of TB hearts and reactor cattle. So we have to convince our farmers that vaccination is a better option for them. So we did a piece of work called a non-inferiority trial that finished in 2017 and uh, I hope to have the paper away to a journal in the next week or so and that will basically say that vaccination is not worse than culling so we can safely replace it for culling and we have proven that it's not worse we haven't proven that it's better because that would take a much bigger trial and we don't have time or money for that but at least to our farmers if we can say something isn't worse than what you have well then why not allow us to switch because we've a lot of evidence to say it will be better but we can actually prove to you that it's not worse so our reactor numbers over the 15 years have fallen from 30 to 40,000 so if we take 30,000 it's fallen down to 15. So wow, that's 15, amazing. 15,000 fewer reactors. And from the taxpayer's perspective, each reactor costs 1,000 euro. So that's 15 million of a saving. And our wildlife program costs 5 million. So it's a very positive return economically. And that's why we continue down that road and continue to get funded. I picked up on something really funny when, when we communicated earlier on before the podcast, and that was that because of the pretty good results with the vaccinations, that you um, started referring to vaccinated badgers as goodgers. I love that. That's a genius name. 
<laughs> yeah, well, it kind of happened a little bit back in the day when I was pitching. We get a license basically to operate from our heritage department. So they give us a license to actually do what we do to badgers. You know, they didn't like giving us licenses to remove a protected species. Their business yeah. is to protect the species. So, so I have to convince them that they had to give me more licenses in the short term, but then there was a long term payoff which would be vaccination and basically a better protected population of badgers. So one of the skeptics there, he said to me one day, what are you going to call all these vaccinated badgers? So I said, I don't know, what do you think we should call them? So he said, I think you should call them goodgers. And, you know, when you reflect on it, it is a very kind of a sensible thing to call them because I read little bits in marketing. And key to marketing is you have to differentiate your product. So a vaccinated badger is very different to an unvaccinated badger in terms of its likelihood of, of succumbing to TB. Now, if you look at a vaccinated badger in the field, there's not much difference because when we reduce our badger densities to a half a badger per square kilometre, our badgers have a lot of food. They're unbalanced. They're a kilo heavier than they were before we started the reduction strategies. So they're living in a very plentiful environment. So they look good. So when you vaccinate them, you don't have a differentiated product. So part of my job is to convince people. So to convince people, you have to put things in a certain way to them. So goodgers really appeal to me because, firstly, the word is good. I mean, everybody is in favour of good, no matter what you put it in front of. So vaccination is good for badgers. Why is it good for badgers? I can say to conservationists because it protects them from TB. To farmers, I can say goodgers are better on your land than badgers because of a whole pile of reasons. To the taxpayer, I can say goodgers are good because they save you a whole pile of money. So every place you turn, it's good, 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 good. And then it's a kind of a nice wordplay. And then I looked into it and the name wasn't registered. So I registered, I own it. I kind of liked it, so what the hell? Um, I, I now own Goodger. <laughs> I love this. I thought I thought it was just a harmless wordplay for the sake of our conversation, and and now it actually turns out that you registered that name. Absolutely, I own it. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely well, love it, having, James. Uh, after having gone on for so long about it, you know, you have to put your money where your mouth is at some point. And when we're writing the non-inferiority study that we'll be publishing at the end of the month, we're going to put Badger and Goodger into that. At the end of the day, science is all well and good. When you're talking to scientists, we have a particular way of looking at things. But at the end of the day, you have to sell it to the person out there who's trying just to make a living, who's trying to farm who's trying to get to the end of the year, educate their children, do all the things normal people are trying to do. So therefore, you have to convince them. And it's easier for me to convince a farmer with goodger than it is with badger. And then if you can bring anything into the kind of a debate that's as polarized as what TB in cattle that mm. makes people smile, well, that isn't bad. You know, you're looking at the center point. You know, the people on the extremes, they don't care about goodgers or badgers. or They just have their own view, and that's what they focus on. But uh, what I focus on is the people in the middle who are trying to farm and to make a living, and then the people in the middle who don't want badgers eliminated. I am totally on your side when it comes to the use of some nice little humor to get people together, to be quite honest. I think it's an icebreaker. So what does the future hold for badgers and cattle and bovine TB in Ireland? Okay, well, we currently have our endemic area basically identified. And in 20% of that, we vaccinate. And in 80% of it, we continue calling. Our minister has announced a change in policy. So it's now government policy that by the end of 2022, 100% of our endemic zone will be covered by vaccination. Within that, we may need to remove something in the order of, say, between 500 and 1,000 animals a year because we will have breakdowns for the foreseeable future. It's a very, very difficult disease. In certain herds, it's particularly difficult to eliminate. And the demographics of the agricultural industry is sort of against us because intensification is going to proceed. So herds are going to get bigger. So the bigger a herd, the more difficult it is to get TB out of it if it gets into it. So there will be ongoing problems. But once we have a badger population that becomes predominantly goodgers, they will have less recycling to the cattle than they would have previously. So while we have given a national aspiration to eliminate TB by 2030, 
that's a tall order. But we might miss that particular date. But my hope is we won't miss it by that very much. And at least we could get to the point where we'll eliminate large breakdowns as an occurrence in the Irish countryside. I wish you really lots of luck that you hit the 2030 target that you set yourself and that you just have Ireland full of good jazz. Yeah, well, I hope actually to be still there in 2030 to be able to see it because it's been a very interesting journey because a lot of what has been done in this country has been done basically by following science. Any policy measure we've taken is based on there's a piece of science somewhere that has actually influenced us in that direction. Okay, maybe 100% of people wouldn't think the science we used is good enough for them or whatever. But given that uh, when I started on my work with the Wildlife Unit, my argument to people was doing nothing isn't an option. So in life, you've got to do something. And then you've got to do something for a reason. And then if you don't have perfect science, if you have science that's not that bad, it's a lot better to actually act on what you have rather than do nothing until you get the perfect piece of science that tells you what direction. Because, you know, who knows? You know, perfection isn't, isn't uh, I hope I never meet it, because God, life would be boring. Oh God, yeah, you're right. <laughs> I don't think it's out there, yeah. so we're safe. Yeah. Can I ask you one last question? So what do you see as the next steps in bringing vaccination to the forefront? Say if the government said we would go ahead with this, what are the kind of things that are required for making this work? You already mentioned that a lot of it requires volunteers, right? Yes, so this is something where the general public can really help. A lot of the objection to badger vaccination has been the assumption that it's really expensive, despite all the evidence. And one of the things that can make it cheaper is that a lot of the work that's involved in vaccinating badgers doesn't require you to have a PhD or something. You know, it's literally helping to find badger sets, help put cages on them, put peanuts in them to you know, get the badgers used to entering them. So there's a lot of opportunity for, for ordinary people to become involved and help. And all of that reduces the cost. So taxpayers reduce the cost of farmers. And I think that should help to also to reach more of a mutual understanding between farmers and the general public. I think often this is something where a lot of the public aren't really aware about how farming works. And a lot of farmers are frustrated that the general public don't understand how their industry works, how their farming practices work, where their food comes from. You know, I think anything which can help to break down those barriers is a good thing. This is one, one way of doing it. I think, though, that in order to to actually address the problem, the only reason we're concerned about TB in badgers is because of the problem of them giving it to cattle. And so this isn't really worth doing if it doesn't work. <laughs> There's no reason to expect it wouldn't work. But, you know, having spoken to farmers who are quite hostile to the idea and what they've said to me, quite rightly, is, well, Rosie, what we need is the evidence that this works. So my response to that is, You know, evidence doesn't fall out of the sky. We have to do the science to get the evidence. And then I think government would be able to look farmers in the eye and say, we've done it. We've, you know, we've got the evidence. We've evaluated this. This is not something we're asking you to take on blind. Thank you very much, Rosie. And good luck with your vaccinations down in Cornwall. And also, if this comes off, uh, sign me up as a volunteer. I haven't set a badger trap in like over 10 years, but, you know, it's um, peanuts and golden syrup, right? And um, off we go. <laughs> We're going to be vaccinating whip snade in the spring. Oh, excellent. So that might be a bit nearer. Oh, I, would, I would love to help. Absolutely. There you go. You just signed me up live on a podcast. Mm-hmm.